This is Twit. The future of farming might be in the capable metal hands of robots. Here to talk about her experience with farm bots is Carrie Davis from Engadget's The Future IRL. Welcome back to the show, Carrie. Hey, great to be here. Thank you. Now, first of all, do you say IRL or do you say the future in real life on your show? I, I say IRL and then I have to explain to everyone what that means. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you for okay. knowing. <laughs> well, uh, let's first get first things first. Um, are you talking about actual robots or, or, or farmers like that wear little um, hats or are we talking about farming machinery? I wish it were the first. Let's make that happen. I would do that story a thousand times. No, sadly. Um, but I would love it. Um, yeah. So farming machinery has come a really long way. And interestingly enough, especially my stepdad's a farmer, I grew up helping farm, is that it's not sort of the big equipment makers like Case or John Deere or any of those sort of leading the way, although they're trying to catch up. It's kind of like Tesla, it's these smaller, still kind of unknown companies known in this space, but not known to a wider audience um, that are really sort of doing interesting things. So you traveled to Salinas uh, for this story, Salinas, California, that we all know if we read any John Steinbeck. Why Salinas? Salinas is the lettuce capital of the world. They make uh, most of the lettuce um, there. I'm harvesting some. See, I'm a total farmer, guys. Um, <laughs> They make lettuce, spinach, um, and any of those sorts of things are mostly made in Salinas. And I went there for a few reasons. Um, one thing I couldn't get into in the piece, and which seems silly because it's 10 minutes long basically, but um, Taylor Farms, which is huge in Salinas, they even have their own lettuce harvesting bot. So it's all of these different machines are sort of designed to, to really take people out of it. And you would, you would say maybe on the forefront, just looking at it, that this means that people might not have jobs, right? Because it's a lot of sort of labor intensive stuff, harvesting or otherwise working with this sort of thing. But they would tell you a lot of the bigger sort of equipment makers and whatnot, that there aren't enough farm workers, that there's been a farm labor shortage for a while. And especially with um, Trump coming into office, it's been even more steep. So I didn't talk about that so much, but basically all the technology that's sort of going to help um, fill that gap and that that is, you know, autonomous harvesting vehicles or auton autonomous machinery to, to just hoe lettuce weeds, which is a big deal. That's what you're seeing on your screen net, net, right now. Um, yeah, I can tell you more about that company if you like. Well, I, I mean, what I'm curious about, which is you're kind of touching on here is the job skill requirements like obviously we've got the traditional you know farm farm work the skills of a traditional farmer and you know everybody going out there and, and doing the the labor um themselves but now you've got let's say in the in the farm of the future you've got robots everywhere kind of doing all this in an automated sort of way and they're smart because they're running ai and they're doing all this object matching and everything like that that shifts the requirements of the workers themselves as far as their particular skills right mm -hmm. that's exactly what everyone told me is that you know there was there will still be farm workers but they won't be maybe the unskilled worker variety it's going to take and there will still be farmers but they will more be managing machines and sort of getting to think about sort of the creative problems that they might have instead of having to do all of the actual labor and that is good for many reasons um you know we're going to have a, a population boom by 2050 it'll be almost 10 million people in the world um and uh, family-owned farms and farmers are declining, especially in the U.S. There aren't enough people that want to stay on farms, right? Everyone's moving to the city. So they would tell you, the people I spoke with, that, that filling that gap with sort of autonomous machinery is the only way we're going to be able to feed people in the future in terms of the things we're used to eating now. So I found that really interesting, too. I know I went into it very worried about existing sort of farm workers and I came out of it, everyone was saying it wasn't a big deal. So I was like, okay, I guess it's not a big deal. Hmm. And just got to focus on the tech itself, which is really interesting. Well, yeah, and the, the interview, one of the interviews, the, 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 the guy at the company was calling it, you know, part of the new collar economy, which you've heard a lot, but did they talk at all about training because it's different. Uh, it's a very different job to be, you know, harvesting lettuce than it is to writing code for a farm bot. I don't think that's going to be the person writing the code. No, they didn't talk much about training. Um, you know, 
Yeah, I, maybe I maybe I sort of accepted everybody's reasoning of why it wasn't a concern too easily, right? Because all the other sort of declines in other jobs would show us that there will be some people left behind. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it will be every farm. And that's one of the big takeaways from the piece. So we ended it on this little sort of specialty farm in Half Moon Bay that was lovely. And it, they only actually work, they have 300 acres, but they only work a few of them. And that's enough to sort of keep it going because everything in California, especially our, the, the big thing is specialty crops. So you need people still to do those things unless you have a monocrop and you know, you're a huge farm maker here, you know, it's something like 400 different crops on average in the state. So they need people to actually be sort of harvesting over here and then doing something over here. And you can't have one machine address all of those different issues. So it will still be a lot of labor. Um, the thing that I really focused on in the piece was with Blue River Technology. And it's a robotics company. It was really interesting people. Um, they basically got started to make an autonomous lawnmower, which I think most people would love. Um, and then they realized there was this sort of easy thing they could do first. And I was calling it easy. I'm sure it's not easy. But they they could start uh, with lettuce hoeing or harv but basically thinning. It's called lettuce thinning. Um, because of the, the germination, you can never tell how many lettuce plants will actually become true lettuces. So everybody, you know, overplants lettuce. And then when they come up, you have to apparently thin them out to 10 inches apart because otherwise they'll like get funky or kill each other and there are like lettuce wars happening. Um, <laughs> so it's this, it's this step that they usually hire um, people to do to go out and, and do lettuce thinning. Um, and it takes a lot of labor. It takes a long time to hoe like all of these little, you know, things. So they made a machine that goes out and uses AI and can, you know, nose distance and can just sort of spray a little herbicide on the ones that should die. And then all the every 10 inches, there's a little lettuce plant. So that was the first one a few years ago. And they got their start in Salinas. So that's another reason we went there. Um, and what they're doing now blew my mind because my stepdad's a farmer. Rather than uh, right now when people need to spray a field, they'll spray the entire thing with herbicide or pesticide. Or if you've seen the planes coming low and then the spray... You know, there's all kinds of things that uh, health concerns, environmental concerns, all of these things come into play um, when you talk about crop spraying. So their new machine can, it has AI and, um, why am I blinking? Oh man, machine learning. There it is. Thank you. They've taught, <laughs> they've taught their program so far a million photos of weed and cotton plants, and they'll continue to teach it another 9 million is the plan. But they can just drag it over, you know, a row of cotton. They've just started testing it this summer. And it can it knows the difference between a cotton plant and a weed. And so it'll look at the weed and only spray the weed with an herbicide, um, which is huge. Um, in the piece, the CEO talks about how that'll save just on average, an average size farmer, something like maybe a, a, if you spend about a hundred thousand dollars on on herbicide alone instead with this machine you would spend only ten thousand so it's a huge cost savings it's good for the environment it's it's amazing that this hasn't been done before and they have more plans for it in the future yeah it's a value add for the people buying uh their produce and, and their vegetables on the other side too because people want it as as pristine you know there's a big movement obviously around organic farming and everything people are very aware of what touches their food before their food, you know, it gets delivered to their home. And I think it, what fascinated me a lot about about your piece um, is kind of the applications of AI and uh, and object recognition, essentially. Like mm -hmm. when I think about the way that automation has been done before in far in in the farms, you know, a lot of it, ha it comes down to kind of this analysis of the size of the of whatever it is be it the apple or whatever but when you get into the world of object recognition you can take some of that uh, obscurity that that could come along with the old way of automating it and make it really super smart and super effective mm -hmm. yeah I agree. I have nothing to add. All right. You said it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about track map? Track map. You talked to them. It looked like you were getting to play a video game. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, so that was um, Colin um, from Track Map. He had a charming New Zealand accent. Um, he is one of the company. He's in charge of one of the companies that was brought into the Western Girls Associations. Um, they have this tech startup, the Innovation and Technology Center, and he was brought in really to get planted in the U.S. because he's already firmly established in New Zealand, and. It, his his program is sort of just a, a cloud and hardware based system where say you have a lot of fields, you're a farmer with a ton of fields and a lot of money. Um, and you have a lot of employees on your field because you're rich and or in your farm because you're rich. So you can set up the system where you tell them exactly which field to go out to because it can get confusing, right? Which which field and they'll say, oh yeah, I got that field on that corner. Yeah, no problem. I sprayed that field. And then you might find out later that they didn't actually get it. So this is very, like a very simple, like checking up on your employees that they actually treated the right field. And the bummer of that behind the scenes info, we were supposed to go out on a, on a field with Colin that day and then the company, a very large, a very large, I'll just say wine company backed out. They wouldn't allow us at the last minute. So I got to do the demo of what you actually do when you drive a tractor, but I was supposed to be in a tractor. So that was a bummer. Uh, dang sad. it. Sad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sad. Um, might, might there be a day where robots are just doing all of our, our farm work for us? Like literally we just put the robots to work, you know, from seed to harvest, they take care of it. I mean, I think as technology gets infused in this in this industry, it's certainly a, a possibility, right? I think so. One of the things that I was really interested in is that there, as of now, and literally I think it's about to change in a few months, there is no true autonomous on a larger scale um, autonomous tractor or whatever. They've all been using GPS and satellite technology for years, I think something like 20 or so years, where in a tractor, and I've done this actually, you can drive and like set the thing and then it steers for you because it knows exactly where you're going. But a human still has to turn around at the end of the row. So they're so close. Um, I have a feeling with a wink, uh, something might be coming in soon. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that would be the dream, right? And I... It certainly won't be, I don't know, and then I, I guess I'm not a farmer, I can't say. I think long term, Jason, that's exactly what's going to happen, mm -hmm. at least for if everything is running right. So my stepdad, the farmer, would tell you something always breaks down and somebody has to fix it. <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. So were yeah. you one of those uh, children of farmers that were encouraged to take over the family farm and then disappointed your family by going into technology? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't think so. I think, I think they never thought that I would want to do that, but I did love, I used to help with the harvest and that's so much fun. If anyone has ever done that before, even if, if you hear of like a third cousin who might need some help, just volunteer. It's so much fun to help with harvest in the fall.